first competition. Mixon, you have 20 minutes. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Neil. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, it's my big pleasure to present this joint work with Hui Chen from MIT and Hong Ye Guo, who is a great student from Warden, and Yan Ji, who is from um, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. As the title suggested, uh, this paper is motivated by uh, a set of stylized facts on the product markets. First, the product market is highly concentrated and documented by a few market leaders, even superstar firms. Not only about that, uh, the, the market leadership is highly persistent, which motivates the highly strategic com competition, uh, including tax inclusion and cooperation. In fact, there has been extensive empirical evidence in the literature showing that the uh, showing that um, the tax inclusion and the cooperation is prevalent in pro uh, product markets. So motivated by this stylized effects above, uh, in this paper, we, we developed a model featuring, uh, which preserve a, in, an explicit role for market concentration and tax inclusion um, to, to de determining the, the, the firms in endogenous cash flows and credit spread and stock returns. So before digging into the details, I'd like to first summarize the main results of the paper. Um, in this paper, in the, in the modern data, we first show the existence of competition and dis distress feedback effect. To, me, to be more precise, think about a firm. When the financial distress of the firm increases, the, pro the probability of default also increases. Uh, as a result, the firm become more impatient and care less about future cash flows and future corporations. And then the firm's current crucial incentive will goes down and the competition intensity will goes up. The heightened co competition intensity will, will push down the profit margin, which further push, pushes, uh, uh, pushes the firm deeper into the financial, deeper into the financial distress. So this is a, a competition distress feedback loop. We also show a new form of financial contagion uh, on this competition network, um, which play a very important role in determining uh, how the idiosyncratic shocks are transmitted across in firms and industries. So more precisely, let's think about one, one adverse reducing quite a shock hitting from market leader A in the industry. Then the market leader A will tend to be become more financially distressed and then compete more aggressively in the industry. In response, the peer from market leader B will also become more, uh, will, will also compete more uh, uh, aggressively and then the profit margin will be further, be further pushed down. In this case, the market leader B tend to become more financially distressed and uh, its credit spread will become higher. And more importantly, this financial condition effect can even go across industries. Now, suppose the market leader B is a common market leader in both industries, one and two, connecting firm A and the C, firm C from different industries. Now that one, an adverse reducing credit shock hitting firm A will make firm C in a different industry more financially distressed. Why? Because Firm, the common market leader B will behave more aggressively, compete more aggressively in both industries in reaction. And uh, importantly, later we'll show the strength of this financial contagion effect highly depends on the accent industry structure and the peers' financial condition, conditions. We push one step further. We show that these two prim fundamental theoretical results actually have very important asset price implications. Uh, one, one implication is that the competition distress feedback effect will help us to rationalize the financial distress anomaly across industries, which is one of the most important and the challenge anomaly in asset price and literature. Um, and also we show this financial contagion effect enrich the set of, of the possible channels, how the idiosyncratic shocks are transmitted cross firms and even industries justifying the interdependence of credit spreads and uh, financial distress among firms, even from different industries. This is important why, the, for one example is this lays the basis for the information-based theory of credit market freeze, freeze uh, such, a, such as Babchuck and the Goldstein 2011. And then 
we, we, we further calibrate the model to uh, assess its quantitative capacity of really explaining the important as, uh, empirical patterns in the data. And also we test the rich set of theoretical predictions in the data. So this is a summary of, the, uh, of our paper. And our model can be viewed as an extension of the standard credit models based on Leland framework. For example, Chen Goldstein dual frame, a uh, Chen dual frame, uh, uh, Colin dual frame, Goldstein 2008, and the Hui Chen Mark paper 2010. Um, like those models, in our paper, firms issue council bond with perpetual coupon rate, uh, BI, and they conduct costless, costless equity financing, and they have to pay corporate tax toll. And uh, their cash flows are subject to an aggregate shock. You can think of this aggregate shock as uh, like a uh, productivity shock or demand shock. And this aggregate shock is priced in the economy with time varying market price risk, a gamma T, and uh, which, which follow a mean reverting process around this long run ma ma uh, discount rate level gamma bar. And uh, the shocks to this market price risk, gamma T itself is also priced in the, in the economy with a constant market price risk, zeta here. So this is basically a simple, simple summarize a parsimonious version of who you can think of this Chen et al. paper or Hui Chen's John Mark paper. Those are the, uh, I would say this is a standard modeling ingredients in the baseline credit models right, uh, these days. And we, we extend this baseline by considering industry equilibrium with strategic competition of duopolies. So you can, you can imagine in our economy, there are many of small industries and within each industry, there are two market leaders and strategically competing with each other. And uh, we further extend our model to allow endogenous cash flows because in the standard Leland framework, including uh, the papers that mentioned in the previous slides, the, the cash flows are postulated exogenously. So in our, one key thing in our paper, in our model, the, the cash flow is highly endogenous. Um, <clears throat> this pi IT I put in red, which we will Folks are talk more about this in the following slides. This is a profitability per custom base MIT. So this pr profitability piety will be determined endogenously determined by tax inclusion. And this EIT is the earnings after tax interest payment and the tax. At last, we, we further in, extend the baseline by adding, incorporating the idiosyncratic left heel jump risk as in Seal and Octor. 2018, because people realize this idiosyncratic tail jumps is important for us to really understand the quantitatively understand this credit spread uh, observed in the data. So more precisely, we assume this MIT, which is custom base of firm I, follow this geometric Brownian motion with the you know the the down, downward uh, idiosyncratic Poisson jump, JIT, with the the Poisson process JIT has the intensity lambda. This lambda captures uh, the, the idiosyncratic left tail risk. When lambda is higher, we see this industry fits higher uh, left tail risk. Here, I want to pause a little bit to emphasize, just keep, now you need to keep in mind this lambda, in our model, the lambda is different from different industries. And this is the only and the key uh, industry heterogeneity will be foc focusing on in this paper. And uh, to, to investigate you know, financial distress, of course, we have to model default and exit. In our model there, are, the firms have two ways to exit. One is endogenous default, just like standard Leland model. And the other one is exogenous replacement caused by this idiosyncratic left tail jump risk, jumps. So uh, upon, uh, for the endogenous default, it's just like Leland model. So the firm I win a custom base, MIT of the firm I, is, is in, you know, randomly fluctuated when it hits the endogenous default boundary, then the bound, at, that, at that boundary, the equity value of the firm will become zero. So the shareholders realize it's optimal for them to, to you know, issue, uh, to, to default and exit. And uh, for the exogenous replacement, uh, you can think this one is caused by this idiosyncratic jump event. And the one interpretation for this idiosyncratic jump event is the replacement by the new market leaders through this disruptive innovation. 
One example is Nokia. Is, is, you can think of Nokia was replaced by Apple in the smartphone market almost overnight. And we, we assume this exit and reinjection that uh, feature to stabilize the industry dynamics following the literature. What, what, what does this mean? Actually, it's quite uh, parsimonious, but a flexible framework to think about the, you know, the, the market leader dynamics. So more precisely, when firm I exit and firm J survives, a new firm market leader will enter with custom base equals to M new equals to Kappa times MJT. MJT is the survivor's custom base at time T. And this Kappa parameter captures how easy, you know, for a new market leader to enter, become a market, market, new market leader. And if Kappa is higher, which means it's easier for, you know, for, 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 for follower to become market leader and replace the uh, old one. And uh, upon the new market leader enters, the new market leader at the initial point of time will optimally choose the debt level, be new, and then they keep the debt level throughout, throughout his life. And uh, when this accident reinjection happens, the game is a reset to a new one. So the game reset. And to investigate the strategic competition, of course, we need to also need to specify the demand system of consumer. So we, we assume a standard CS demand system for firms. Basically the firm's, firm I's demand, CIT, is a downward sloping function. Uh, is a, uh, 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 it's linearly depends on the customer base very intuitively. Customer base share of the firm in the industry. MIT, remember, is the firm I's customer base. And MT is here, is the total customer base of the industry among the market leaders. And also the CIT follow this downward sloping, um, uh, is a downward sloping function of the relative price of the firm I relative to the industry PT, industry price index PT. Industry price index is the weighted average of the price, firm, price of firm one and firm two. And that also depends on the total demand at the firm level. And how to discipline the total demand of at firm level we further postulate an isoelastic firm level demand curve. So it's very standard. So the CT uh, it, it equals to the MT, the, the industry level customer base multiplied by the uh, industry level price index to the power minus eta. So this uh, uh, minus epsilon. So this epsilon is cross industry elasticity, which is a bigger than one, but it's smaller than the within industry elasticity, which is eta which is a standard in the literature and consistent with the data. Also, so now to close, the, close this equilibrium model, we, we, all, we, we, we not only need this demand side, we also need to model the supply side, basically the technology, production technology of firm. So here we just adopt very simple production technology, which is a linear production technology. That is firm I will incur cost omega times YIT to produce the amount of goods YIT. So it's a linear. So this, how do you think about the cost? You can think it's like operating costs, including labor costs, okay? And the, given this in the equilibrium, so the optimal production choice is like bam bam solution. Actually it's all the firms will, will, will it's always optimal for the firms to produce uh, in, up to the level exactly match this total demand of CIT because the firms will figure out in the equilibrium is always, at least in our setup, is always optimal to choose the, to set this profit, um, the price, marginal price, PIT, above the marginal cost. And uh, of course, this linear production technology is a simplification. Uh, it, it, but it, this has been a, a widely adopted in the IO and the macro literature. And uh, given all this, we, we just do simple algebra. So we have an expression. Remember the key thing, we go back to this Leland framework, the one major deviation from our model and the, and the Stan Leland framework is the endogenous profit mar uh, profitability pi IT. So here, the, the pi, given the demand system specification and the production technology, we know this uh, endogenous profitability pi IT depends on the price, the prices of both firms. Now the question is how does these prices of both firms are endorsement determined in the equilibrium when the firms face externality? Okay. In fact, 
the, uh, the profit margins or profitability is endogenously determined by tax inclusion by, uh, because firms can sustain inclusive profit margins in our model by punishing deviation, which means suppose Neil and I, we are two market leaders in this uh, economy. If I deviate Neil, say Winston, I will, I will punish you in the next second instant with Paulson rate per side. And you can think of this Paulson rate is like monetary efficiency or uh, you know, this, we, we summarize all this in the very parsimonious parameter. And uh, what is the punishment? The pun punishment is very simple and uh, simple, uh, simple one. And uh, is I say, uh, uh, I say cons uh, is, is incentive compatible, which is Neil will say, let's go to non-closing natural premium for a long period of time. Okay, in that case, so, both of uh, the, the profit margin of both of us was at a low, very low level for a long time. And uh, yeah, you see, Winston, wait a minute, we know this is, in, this is a super game in framework. There are multiple natural equilibrium that can satisfy these IC constraints. Yes, that's true. So basically, we, how do we see, the problem is how do we select the, the equilibrium? So we focus on the equilibrium such that the firms include as, at a, as a profit margin as high enough as high as possible in the sense that they reach this collusion capacity, which means in the equilibrium, the IC constraint, we, we focus on this exclusive national equilibrium such that the IC constraint are binding state by state. Actually, this is uh, uh, the, the equilibrium selection procedure adopted by many papers in the literature, especially by those who, who want to incorporate this kind of repeated games into dynamic framework, uh, you know, this GE or asset pricing framework. So given all this, so you can, you can, this a few lines, the key thing of our paper. If you, I hope you can really grab this. So the key thing is given this endogenous profitability piety is determined by the collusion capacity. If the collusion capacity is high, Neil and I, the market leaders, we can collude on as high, at a higher profit margin. So our cash flow level will be higher. And this collusion, importantly, the collusion capacity is endogenously, in turn endogenously determined by you know, by our two major reasons in our model. One is aggregated, the other one is idiosyncratic. And the aggregate reason is, the, is this discount rate, the only aggregate state variable in our economy. So you can, you can think about uh, the, the aggregate discount rate or risk premium fluctuate over time, that's the gamma T. The other one is firms financial distress. So when the discount rate gamma T rate increases or financial distress or firm increases, the, few, the firms in the industry will become more impatient and the future value, uh, the value of future cash flow and the cooperation or even uh, and the punishment will become lower. Because of this, the collusion capacity in current period will be lower. That's why the, you know, you have, the firms can only collude on lower, lower level of profit margin. And we want to emphasize such mechanism are weaker for industries with higher idiosyncratic tail risk, lambda. Why is very intuitive? Uh, this is because- so, Winston, mm -hmm. I, sorry, I have to interrupt. I didn't want to interrupt earlier. You have like three, four minutes left, just so- Okay, uh, yeah. okay, I'll, 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 I'll move. Sorry, I muted you. Sorry about that. Uh, can you please unmute? I was gonna okay. mute myself. Okay. So with high lambda, the firms, they don't have future, so they don't collude. So this mechanism is gone. Okay, so to illustrate financial contagion effect, let's focus on panel B. Panel B is the profit margin. The blue curve is the inclusive equilibrium. The red dot curve is the non collusive natural equilibrium. This is the, how this profit margin depends on the custom base MIT, your peers. When your peer become more and more financial distressed, endogenously in the inclusive natural equilibrium, so your profit margin will, be, will decrease. By contrast, if, the, if you are in the non collusive national equilibrium, your, the peers profit margin will increase. So this is very important. This is a unique prediction of, of our model, okay? And also to, to look at this competition distress feedback effect, we just look at this, how the industry's profit margin, the sensitivity of industry's profit margin to the aggregate discount rate shock. So here we look at the focus on this blue curve. It become more and more negative when the industry firms in the industry become more and more financially distressed. By contrast, if in a non-closed national equilibrium, it's remain constant, okay? 
And uh, also based on this, 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 uh, this feedback effect will help us to explain this financial distress anomaly for industries with low uh, idiosyncratic tail risk and high idiosyncratic risk, which uh, high idiosyncratic risk in the plot is characterized by this black dash curve. So in panel B, you can see intuitively the industry with, with high tail risk, left tail risk, they, they are more distressed because they have high discount rate. But if you look, they're, re, they're, they're, they're less risky in the sense that their exposure to the aggregate discount rate shock is less, less negative. That's why you combine these two together. You will say, you know, the, the industries who are more financially distressed due to this higher idiosyncratic left tail risk, they are, they are less risky because they have more, less negative exposure to the aggregate um, uh, discount rate shock. So we test this idiosyncratic, uh, we test this financial contagion effect by, by examining whether the idiosyncratic shock on highly distressed firms has positive effect on your peers' profit margin and the negative effect on your peers' credit spread. Actually, we see that's the case. And also, we, our model implies okay. this, so this effect. You have one, okay, I'll, okay, I'll, 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 one, one more minute. Okay. okay. Thank so, you. and this is more pronounced in the industry with more balanced market shares among market leaders, and also this is the financial distress. Uh, this is a feedback effect. So basically, we but we test the feedback effect to ask whether the industries whose distant default is lower have high, uh, more uh, less negative exposure to the discount rate shocks. Actually, that's the case, and the result is robust by different sorting and a different sample. And uh, this result can be strengthened in the different diff scenario. Basically, we, we, we use the, we instrument the exogenous change of the market competitiveness using this uh, large tariff cuts. We, uh, basically, we see that both financial, uh, both feedback and continuing effects become weaker when the market structure of the industry exogenously become more competitive. So now let me summarize. In this paper, we propose the first elements of tractable dynamic model for the interplay between endogenous strategic competition and financial distress. And this model generated a set of novel testable theoretical implications, including this competition and the distress feedback effect and the financial contagion effect on the on a new form of com competition network. And those primitive theoretical results have very important asset price implications it helped us to understand better of this financial distress anomaly across industries and uh, the, why the credit spread and financial distress across firms and even from different industries interdependent with each other. Okay, thank you, Neil. Great, thank you very much. We are very happy to have Eric discuss the paper. Winston, if you can unshare your screen sure. and Eric, you can share yours. Okay, can you guys see that? Yeah, we see it and hear you. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks for uh, to the organizer for inviting me to discuss. This was uh, something I've been put off uh, to to read this paper, so I'm glad I, I got the opportunity. Uh, I think you know Winston did a good job considering uh, this is really a hard hard paper to present because the model already sort of like takes uh, two things from two different directions. Uh, first, there is a sort kind of sophisticated model of firm interaction. Uh, Winston didn't really do justice to the model. I mean, this is a dynamic game of competition with endogenous collusion. So there is a large tradition in the IO literature of thinking about uh, how we can actually sustain collusions and what are the sort of like elements of product market structure that allows firm to sustain collusion. And so they kind of embed this in a model of firm capital structure. It's still, it's, you know, it's a simple lean model with jump risk on taste shocks, but you know, it is sort of like a fit to, to uh, bring those two together. And I think like part of the value of the paper is to bring these two components together. But I will also argue that it's, it's, it's kind of hard and I have like a few qualms about you know, uh, the interface between those two. And then you know, they don't stop there uh, and they go on and, and make some uh, quantitative predictions. So industry sensitivity to discount rates, I think that's maybe the more interesting channel and more important channel of the paper. Uh, that goes on to explain part of the distress anomaly, the fact that firms that are closer to the uh, default boundary have lower returns. And, and essentially, I mean, if you, one message of the paper is really how firm capital structure can ripple through the pricing decisions of an industry and 
vice versa, right? So there's like a, a neat interplay between product market structure and, and capital structure. So there's a lot of cover. Uh, I just want to present a f the framework and insist on a key mechanism. I think that there's a lot going on and, and they're talking about predation, collusion, price wars, etc. I just want to make you understand why do firms collude and why do they stop? That I think will get us to the main uh, mechanism and then discuss a little bit of the prediction. So how does collusion interact with firm capital structure and vice versa as so this feedback contagion effect. And then I'll, I'll say a few things about so like some of the recent trends that we know of in product market structure and, and how this actually uh, uh, interact with, with this paper and what this means for maybe uh, what we observe in, in capital, capital uh, structure. Okay, so the model is really so like, think about, about collusion. If, if I want to summarize what I think is the key mechanism, but not the only mechanism, uh, which is good, good and bad, but let's focus on this for now. Uh, we have a single distress firm that needs cash flows now, okay? Uh, think of it being close to the boundaries and wants to not recapitalize, but you know, it needs to uh, increase its profit margins or else it might uh, dangerously approach uh, uh, its default boundary. So what the important keyword here is now, right? If that firm wants cash flows now, what they're gonna do is that they're gonna compete aggressively for market shares, okay? So they're really going to what we think in terms of, so like perfect competition, they're gonna go out there and maybe cut prices. And this is going to end up in uh, uh, sort of like an industry uh, price war here. So like, you know, industries are gonna compete, uh, uh, firms are gonna compete within the industry, uh, cut their prices. And eventually, what are we gonna get out of this? Well, overall, the industry profitability is going to go down, right? I mean, if we go into like a full uh, uh, Bertrand competition, you know, prices are gonna be uh, down to cost. And, and this is no way in the at least medium run to get out of your boundary and all firms in the industry are gonna get one step closer to their boundary, at least are going to edge a little bit uh, closer to distress. Okay, and that's really the feedback here because now before you had one firm that needed cash flow now, and now you have two or three firms, right? All the firms in the industries are edging a little bit closer towards their boundary. And so they feel a little bit more inclined to compete for market shares, right? They all want to increase the market share uh, uh, because they need the cash flows now. What's important to understand in, in this paper is that this is not where they stop. This is sort of like you know, the standard uh, uh, industry equilibrium that might affect capital structure. But what's kind of interesting is that discount rates here are going to affect how firms trade off now versus uh, the future. And so if you have, let's say, high discount rates, clearly the need cash flows now is going to be really, really important, right? If you have pretty much low discount rates, well, then, you know, uh, sure, you might be distressed, but since you put a little bit more weight in the future, you are actually going to be less incentivized to, to compete uh, uh, aggressively. And so there is going to be this really neat interaction between like how discount rates is going to shape uh, uh, how firms compete within, within an industry. Okay, so in terms of the model, uh, uh, I think this is how like, I would really encourage graduate students to look at this because this is how, you know, writing hard or uh, complex microfinance models is not always easy. And it's all about like how you pick the elements really carefully to make them fit together. And I think they really did an admirable job doing this. So they take, you know, a model of competition that's very simple. So essentially you have two firms that face an isoelastic demand curve and have fixed marginal cost. I mean, we can, again, like, I think having fixed marginal cost is not ideal for at least taking it to the data, but you know, you have to make some choices and, you know, I commend them for, for doing them. And then you have a taste shock that, you know, they call customer days. And again, that's all about like how you bring this to the data, but that's essentially a taste shock at the level of the firm. And so basically firms are going to be exposed to their uh, uh, consumers, to their customers being fickle. And, you know, consumers can actually move from one firm to the other, uh, subject to, you know, Bronian and, and jump risk. And that means that gonna, that's fickleness in customers is going to drive most of the variation in, in cash flows. Okay, so that's all like the comp competition environment, essentially two firms that compete for customers and those customers, it's all like uh, exposed to shocks that one day uh, they like Cheerios and the following day they wake up and suddenly they really wanna eat uh, Fruity Loops or something. 
Okay, and then firms are gonna choose collision strategy or competitive strategy. And, and it's really the choice, and it's not you know, uh, uh, white or black here. It's really about uh, how strong of a collision strategy you're gonna choose. And so they're gonna trade off short-term market shares for long-term profit margins. And that's really sort of like the key element of, of trade-off that's going to make this sort of like a dynamic uh, 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 game. And it's an interesting sort of like uh, uh, dynamics. And then there are other stuff that, that Winston talked about that I think are less essentials and, and in some ways kind of problematic, which is entry threat. Uh, but I think I'd like to focus more about sort of like the collusion part. On the capital structure and you know, firms as in Leland model, firm, firm choose their debt level at uh, uh, initiations. I think there are some, maybe some issues of stationarity I didn't quite understand because if we have new firms coming in, like what's the debt level they're gonna choose depending on their size. But in any case, given the initial debt level, uh, uh, like variation in profits, so variation in sort of like the market shares and the price setting is going to tell us how close firms are to their default uh, uh, boundary. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, explain a little bit about like this collusion uh, thing and, and how it works with the discount rate. So you can see that, you know, with, when you have isoelastic demand, which is essentially what we know in macro as sort of like Dixit stick list, uh, we have sort of like the, the market share. CI is like how many consumers buy from, uh, from I and C, think of C as being like the total uh, demand for, for the industry is a ratio of the taste shock that is MI times the ratio of uh, prices. So PI is the price set by firm I over the uh, uh, price index P and then eta is uh, price elasticity of demand. And so a peaceful equilibrium when we're firms collude, right? So it's only peaceful firm. Well, you know, as what, what we'll do, we could merge those two firms and sort of like maximize joint profit by trying to extract maximum rent from, from consumers. So we're gonna extract high prices, PI and PJ, right? The two firms that operate are gonna have high prices and maybe demand, aggregate demand is going to be uh, a little bit lower, but profits are going to be maximized. And on, on the other hand, going towards a more competitive equilibrium would mean that one firm would deviate. So you'd lower your price to still some market share. So PI decreases, but CI, right? The market shares you're gonna gain more than compensates you for this drop in price. And so in the short run, you're going to have higher revenue. Why do I say in the short run? Well, because that's just before the other firm responds. Once the other firm responds, well, their PJ is going to go down, right? They are going to lower their own prices and then steal back some market shares from you. Eventually, as we know, so like going back to so like a Bertrand equilibrium where firms are gonna price at cost. It might not go all the way there, but uh, uh, that's going towards that, that uh, limit here. And so if you're far from the boundary, well, the trade-off leans towards sustaining long-term long gains, right? If you're far from the boundary, you actually don't, don't need this quick buck today, right? You can sort of like uh, uh, manage your profits and, and think about total NPV of the firms. And, and actually it's easier when all firms are far from, from their default boundary to collude. If you're close to the boundary, at least if one firm's close to the boundary, then there are gonna be incentives to deviate. And firms are gonna try to choose those short-term gains and, and being a little bit more competitive. And this is not about, you know, even if you think your competitor is, if you see your competitor being close to the boundary, there are some effects such as, I think that's what they call predation, right? You are going to anticipate that if you lower your price, you might actually kick your uh, uh, opponent out. And I think I was uh, uh, talking with, with uh, uh, Bob Goldstein yesterday, and then he was telling me, well, this sounds like what Southwest, I think, did in the 80s or 90s, that they really like aggressively competed on prices, uh, knowing that, you know, in the airline industries, firms are highly levered and add, and so like drop them to bankruptcy. Okay, so I think there's like lots of, of elements that are like really realistic. And then it's really about sort of like the trade-off of today versus, uh, uh, so like sustaining collision that will give you profits uh, in the in the long run. Now, how does it work with discount rates, and 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 why does it make make it interesting to interact with with discount rates? So, the threat of, of non collusion is the following. So after a bad shock, as I said, firms lower their profit margins. There is more competition, brings them closer to the default boundary, and then there is sort of like this second round effect on profit margins, right? So high distress. So that means that you know you lose some, uh, you lose sorry, 
you lose some customers, or at least you are at risk of losing customers. That means we have fewer incentives to collude. And there is going to be uh, competition distress feedback. Okay, so when discount rates are high, what happens is that they steal the trade off towards short term gains, right? So when discount rates are high, I really value the present more than the future. So I really need that quick buck. That quick buck is actually really, really valuable to me. And then we edge towards a competition, competition equilibrium. This only matters if firms actually collude. If I'm in a competitive equilibrium, actually, this discount rate thing doesn't matter that much. And what we see here is that discount rates only matter when the distress feedback channel is operative. So when this distress feedback channel is not operative, so firms either are fully competing or firms are actually away from the uh, firms are actually away from their default boundary, discount rates actually don't matter to them because they are just going to uh, collude and maximize long-term profits. And so that leads you to sort of like a predictions that the distress anomaly is essentially, well, discount rates are not going to affect me if I compete. Discount rates are going to affect me if I'm sort of like colluding. And then there is sort of like a third zone that they don't express that's like, well, if I'm really way out of the boundary, discount rates shouldn't, shouldn't affect me, which sort of like tends to make you think that, okay, so high distress firms are gonna have low expected returns because they are in any case not going to be affected by discount rates anymore because you know we can't really bring them to compete more than than they are already okay so a few comments about collusion i think that you know bringing a model of collusion is it's kind of hard and and they really do a good job but i think it could benefit from narrow focus on the empirical side so you know they look at 125 industries which are basically most of the uh, i think sic three or four digits industries uh, in crisp CompuStat sample. And I think it would be nice to have some examples of which industries actually collude. So like, do we have tangible evidence of firms not competing on prices and also this depending on their capital structure, almost like a case study, right? So, you know, there's a large literature in IO that studies implicit collusion, uh, following lots of papers written in, on the theory side in the nineties. And typically they say, well, it's hard to disentangle collusion and high prices from other things like you know like limited capacity, uh, high growth in demand, constraints, uh, product differentiation, and that's why it's hard to bring antitrust cases, right? So is it really collusion, or like are we observing something else? And you know the IO literature has focusing and has been focusing on specific industries. There are lots of paper in airlines, hospitals, the beverage industry, the retail gasoline uh, 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 industry, and and you know there is a reason for that. That's because then they really know what's going on in the sense that they know about the capacity of firms and they know whether it's collusion or some of the or like other factors that might mask uh, uh, high, high prices. And on the other hand, like, you know, they use one factor that actually shapes collusion, which is discount rate. So basically patience. And, and we know, I mean, that's one factor that, that says like, it's easier to collude if we care more about the future than, than about the present. And, and but there are other things that shape collusion. So we know that collusion is easier with large barriers to entry when there are few competitors. So when it's more concentrated in industries, when price transparency is high. So industries where so like prices are observed, example, the airline industry. Uh, and so Eric, sorry, this is Neil, just want to let you know, you have five minutes. Okay, perfect, thank you. And so here, you know, the more relevant factors are discount rate and, and market growth, but like, it'd be nice to sort of like motivate a little bit for why why we focus on those like in finance it's natural to think about discount rates and i think that's fine but like at least rule out like the other ones are being like sure we understand that you know in some industries what's going to matter is discount rates uh, uh for collusion but that's you know that's not so sort of like the end of the uh story and to to finish what i wanted to to show is like a few trends so i picked this from uh, fiona scott morton at yeah so like a nice review of recent development on uh so like the uh, uh, IO literature on, on competition. And, and she took this data from the uh, Department of Justice, which actually uh, reports how many suits were filed or civil cases were brought uh, uh, on the, uh, anti, in the antitrust division. And what you see, and, and maybe it's an artifact of the data, but what you see is there's been really sort of like a decline in antitrust suit filed. And whether that's evidence that there's more collusion now, or at least it's easier to sustain collusion now than it was before, you know, that's 
I'm sure it's an open question. So on IO, there are many things that could drive the fact that there are fewer cases that are filed. Maybe they're now focusing on a few cases and those are one. I mean, there are many reasons that this might have gone down, but at least they also like tells me, oh yeah, well, maybe there is something happening in collusion and collusion is more important now than maybe it was in the seventies when we changed, uh, uh, we moved maybe to like the Bok do doctrine of, of thinking about antitrust law and, you know, Relating this to uh, uh, what we know, like, you know, it's been criticized, but at least thinking about the rise of, of uh, market power from the Deloitte Écoute and Hunger paper, you know, this trend in profit margin, I was just kind of like asking myself, well, do we have similar trends in, in capital structure, right? This paper makes a strong case saying like, well, if there is more collision, this is going to mean something for, for uh, uh, capital structure, or at least for, um, market anomalies. And so are financial distress anomaly more prevalent in the 2000s? Is the link between capital structure and product market tighter in, in the 2000s than it was before when maybe the economy was, at least in some industries, was, was more competitive? So I think these are interesting questions. On the other hand, you could do the same thing in finance, right? We have downward trends in interest rates. Does it mean something for collusion? Does it mean that I can explain actually uh, how we can sustain higher collusion? Uh, so that, I think those are interesting questions that, you know, the authors can ask, I mean, or speculate at least. Uh, Winston didn't talk about the data. I thought I would have, I would do him a favor and, and talk about it uh, because I have this in my slide. I just, I don't, I don't have much to say. The one thing, there is one thing I want to mention. Uh, there, one thing is that I'd like to understand a little bit more about, about magnitude. So what's a reasonable change in collusion? in the data that I don't really know what this means. I guess I can understand in terms of profit margins, but I'd like to have some numbers that sort of like speak to me. It's like, what's a reasonable change in collusion in response to a firm moving closer to distress? So it's sort of like almost seeing like tangible numbers that firm needed that much money given its debt level. And so they decreased their prices by that much to increase their market share and that increased the revenue by X, okay? It's something that's all like, the numbers are like add up in the sense that, you know, they had to make this debt payment and that's why this, they stole this market shares. And the last comments I have is one of timing. I'm not timing, but really frequency. So here, there are like basically two models playing together, right? There's a financial side and the real side. And my feeling, but again, this is only a feeling in that, and this could be really easily addressed, is the fact that frequency of firm cooperation is likely to be slower than ones in, in financial markets. And all the regressions are so like assuming that frequency or the timing of all these things happen at the same time on the same frequency basis. And, you know, looking at contemporaneous correlation between the real side and the financials, financial markets, but the real side is likely to be more persistent. You know, like all of the shocks are basically taste shocks on, on what customers are going to do. And we know this is fairly persistent. So I'm just sort of like wondering when we bring this to the data, how can we sort of like try to match something that's moving at a higher frequency and something that's really like low frequency in nature, right? Collusion doesn't happen overnight. It happens over like, you know, repeated relationships that builds over time, uh, uh, etc. Anyway, so, uh, let me wrap up here. Uh, I have some other comments, but I'll let the uh, authors go through my slide later. So final thoughts, very interesting paper. I really encourage, I mean, everybody, but especially uh, uh, graduate students to go look at this for how to write a macrofinance paper. I think this is, it's been really, really uh, uh, instructive, right? You can see the typing between capital structure and the dynamics of product market structure. That's not, you know, it's been done a little bit, but, but I think this is really highlighted in, in a nice way. And there is some like nice evidence of, of how this uh, actually addresses the distress anomaly and, and how it's, it's related to product market. The last thing I want to say is that I think what's interesting and like what's an opening to this paper, it's like, you know, in finance, we keep talking about the common ownership problem. And I'm like, when I was reading this, like, oh, it's funny, like in finance, we talk about common ownership and it seems to be like, all we talk about, about sort of like capital financing structure and then how it links to uh, market competition. So I almost feel like there has to be some kind of a, a, a link between some of the collusion here. And, and the capital structure. But of course, this, those are not well-formed thoughts, so I'll just leave it out there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Eric. Um, we are running a little bit late here, so Winston, if you was, just wanna real, uh, address the uh, discussion really quickly, so we also have time for uh, questions from the audience. And if you have questions in the audience, please uh, raise your hands so we have an idea of how many. Thank you.
Right. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Eric, for the thoughtful discussion and valuable points. You are definitely one of the top experts in the interaction of IO and asset pricing. And uh, to yes, all points are well taken. To to uh, to 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 respond to your point, let me do the reverse order. So because it's more fresh, but quantitative, yes, actually, one of the value we we spent we, we work so hard not only to push forward the theory of build this quantitative model. Actually, we can use this model the to 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 study more more to more numbers relevant numbers and the quantitative effects and uh, even do decompositions of the you know th when the firm lower the price whether how much of this uh, price undercutting comes due to this self defense and due to pre predative uh, motivations actually this is a very hot topic in IO recent. Uh, recently, one of my senior colleague at Warden from the Econ Department just had an ER paper focused on discussing this quantitative decomposition of those, you know, the different motivations uh, behind the, the the competition. So this is a uh, that that's a very interesting, great point. Maybe that's a separate paper. And you talk about the trends. That's also very interesting. But in this paper, because in the end of the day, we we want to. Uh, use this mechanism to help us to understand some asset price implications for the trends. Yes, um, uh, it's outside the model right now. It can be interest rate declining or can be, you know, uncertainty being increasing, idiosyncratic volatility being increasing, and also the elasticity being increasing. So uh, 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 de decreasing. So all these are like a, um, possible channels. One, for example, one paper, uh, I know recently been done is by Ernest Liu and his co-authors uh, Sufi and uh, from Princeton they have a econometric on our paper so basically they say the interest rate de declining can help to to explain this uh, you know this uh, slow uh, this trend of increasing profit margin so uh, and for the antitrust yes actually we explore that in the early version we even look at the cross-section heterogeneity of of the uh, in the you know antitrust enforcement across different industries, but later we kind of didn't push so hard because it's really hard. This you know this antitrust versus collusion. Uh, you know if you have a high antitrust, which means maybe you have high collusion, or you know it's like uh, this causal is not clear. You know it's like okay, it's like so a police maybe... and a, and a crime. Yeah. And uh, can we can we take yeah. some time for we have some questions from the sure. audience. We also want to have time for so maybe you can chat afterwards with the with the with the rest of the stuff. Uh, the first question is from Esther Fayek. Can you uh, unmute yourself? I am unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Thanks. Okay. Um, so yeah, adorable paper. Um, I just have a question about the the big picture or the implication mm -hmm. that we should draw from the paper yep. so there's some literature that you cited at the beginning which is like very well known a cow and Lo the locha that points out that the fact that markups are increasing okay mm -hmm. and so now if the mechanism of your paper uh, i mean if we if we, if we, if we take up from the mechanism of your paper that should basically imply that there is less financial distress because i mean the mechanism of your paper says that the more financial distress there is the the less uh, the incentive to collude so if we see increasing markup and assuming we agree with this literature i'm not taking a mm -hmm. stand on, mm -hmm. on whether i agree or not but i'm just i'm just asking assuming that this this evidence is true that should yeah. imply that firms are less financially distressed. And the second question is a little bit normative. Like if financial distress is reducing collusion and is reducing markup rents, then it should be good. I mean, it's well for improving. Yes, okay. So let me, uh, yeah, both are like fundamental print questions. The first one is, is actually still about the trends. I, 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 I would think your question is about trends. So our paper is really, we don't have the capacity, our model to, to really explain the trends because we fix some like primitive structural parameters which are important to think about trends, like interest rate and uh, you know, the idiosyncratic risk and so on, and the elasticity because one main channel, if I, the takeaway from uh, Lucas and the Kohi and Howard paper, they have written GFE on our paper, on, uh, try to understand the trends through structural estimation. One takeaway from me from that is they argue actually the mainly from this uh, innovations R and D, which is you can take it mapping to parsimoniously mapping to our framework. It's more like this cross industry 
uh, or, or cross uh, cr uh, this cross industry elasticity become becomes uh, 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 sorry becomes smaller and smaller, right? So because this this R and D make your goods all goods across different industries more and more differentiated. So you, that that's one way to think about this, but we don't have this in our paper, and. Uh, uh, and the second question is, um, uh, uh, sorry, Esther, can you, can you repeat a second question? <laughs> kind of Very simple, it's just a normative yeah. one. So oh. if financial distress reduces pollution, okay. then yeah. we should have a lot of financial distress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that, that, <laughs> that that's, a, uh, so, okay. So there's a, so if you push the welfare, I agree, there's a, definitely this channel, that's an interesting channel. Because now the, you, you basically basically the financial distress and the leverage can like force the, the firms compete more aggressively. That's time, that kind of quality will definitely be there. And if it's lower, it will lower the price. But, but at the same time, with it become more financial distress, there are other channels will affect the household side, right? The, the labor income, the, the jobs. So it, in the end of the day, the channel is all there, but it's quantitative, general equilibrium effects. So it's yeah, it's it's definitely a first order question, but it's uh, it's outside our paper. Wait, so maybe maybe we, we also add some. we have a question also from uh, uh, Nicolas Crusay. If you can, uh, yeah, do I mute Nicolas? Yes, uh, just um, yeah, briefly. It was just uh, connecting me to some. Other papers. So this reminded me of a paper by uh, Gilchrist, uh, Schönle, Simon, Zakrajek from I think 2017 VAR, mm -hmm. and they also look at uh, the relationship between price competition and mm -hmm. essentially financial frictions. Um, and I, but I think it was so the mechanism was qualitatively quite different because they have customer habits, and so I think in that world. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is if you get a bad shock and your or financial shock, so you become more impatient. What you want to do is actually raise prices or some, to extract some of the rents from the customer's habits. And inversely, if you're not financially constrained, you have room to lower prices and gain market share. And so, so I can wonder whether the collusion point would be weakened mm -hmm. if you had, you know, um, this dynamic relationship between the firm and its customers uh, or not. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So in our current model, we don't have this endogenous uh, uh, endogenous uh, custom based accumulation channel. But uh, according to Gilchrist Simon's paper, that channel is it, important for his, for his purpose. But uh, even in a separate paper by Yan, me, and, uh, and Wei, we, we, we actually have that channel. As, if, as long as that channel is not strong enough, all this effect will go through. And the second is uh, that paper, uh, for, Simon, for our paper, we focus more on uh, the so this kind of feedback effect, distress, competition feedback is more, you think is, is time series dimension. But that paper, uh, Simon's paper, when he say this more liquidity constrained firms, they tend to raise their markup, markup it's 100% it's, it's within industry cross firms. So that's very important difference. Okay. Uh, great, thank you very much. Uh, we will, uh, then probably wrap up here and meet again in five minutes for the uh, the last talk of this session. So 12th um, or noon Eastern time. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks.